Hello, Bill. Good afternoon, Matt. Yes, it's a little later uh, than we normally take. Welcome <laughs> to the DMZ. Uh, I'm out of the basement in my own house. We're uh, matching today. Have you noticed this? We're both wearing gingham, sort of blue gingham shirts. I feel like this. I feel like this particular shirt was like the MSNB shirt, like for six months in 2011 or something. <laughs> I'm like the last guy to still wear it. Uh, I may apparently not the last guy because uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing it as well. And I think we've been doing this for 11 or 12 years. And this is probably the first time we've ever dressed alike <laughs> on an episode. So That's, I, I did someone else's video interview before this. So I had to look nice for it. <laughs> Unlike when I talked to you, where I always dress you know, slovenly. Well, uh, thank you for dressing for the occasion. And uh, you could just wear it for the next several days. Wear it to your Thanksgiving dinner. You know? Well, so are, are, are you violating CDC guidelines? Are you having uh, Thanksgiving with family? No, I'm going to stay as far away from family as possible, Bill. You know that. Um, hello, Laz. Hello. <laughs> um, hey. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't see why people are so bent out of shape that they're not traveling low distances to have awkward family dinners. Like, do you, so here's your chance to like be at home, like not stress, cook what you want, cook what you don't cook, what you don't want. Well, I get, I do, I do get it. And I actually have a piece coming out at the daily beast about uh, loneliness and sadness and, you know, the things that bring us joy tend to be, you know, the things we can control that is are things like family, uh, friendships, faith, community, and those things are really hit hard by COVID. And so I think that, you know, not being able to gather together for Thanksgiving is I am, I, you know, I, I do. I also understand the thing about not driving eight hours or going to an airport, you know, when you're, you get a day off and then what do you do with it? You, you travel with a bunch of kids to see people that you probably don't want to see anyway. I get that too, but um it's really a double it's it's really a double edged sword i think uh so would you normally be cooking on thanksgiving well it it really varies but i think normally we would probably be going over to uh my brother in law's house and uh with my in laws so my you know my my mother in law my father in law uh and probably even my wife's granddad might even come by um so it's a little bit it's a, it's a little bit sad. My wife's granddad is uh is I think he's like 97. Wow. Um and 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 we just last Christmas we spent we did that with you know with her grandpa and grandma and, and she passed away this year. So like you never know what's going to be your last Thanksgiving with a family member and to not see them over the holiday is uh you know it is a sacrifice. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little lucky that, you know, I'm, I'm already seeing my mother, you know, but I'm, uh, I, I, I see her regularly. So she's, she's in the pod. Uh, yes. so she'll be with us for, for Thanksgiving as well as one other family that we've been potting with. Uh, you gotta right. plan ahead. Well, you gotta, you gotta plan your pod. there to be people you can trust. And, uh, as much as I love, uh, some of my in-laws, not all of them are as rigorous at, <laughs> at uh, social distancing as, as I am, as, as we as we would like to be, I think I told, did I, I don't know if I told you this. I think I said it on a podcast, how, how my mother-in-law stood in, you know, stood outside my door and told me that COVID was going to go away as soon as the election was over. <laughs> so, <laughs> there was a reason she was standing outside the door. So are there things you're going to cook now that you don't I get to have? Care. Cause now you're in control of the menu. I'm not in control of anything, Bill. <laughs> You can't make a request. I'll, you can't do, as, I'll do as I'm told. So is, is Aaron doing the cooking? Yeah, I think it'll probably be fairly traditional, uh, but it, it'll be minimal, though. I mean, we're not going to it's it's going to be a, a pretty simple year and for us. How about you? Um, it, we're, we're, I mean, we often host, so things won't be too different. Um, I'm going to I'm going to make my mac and cheese. Um, which is, is that a, is that a thing? My yeah, I mean, well, I, I've I've made different mac and cheeses over the years, but there's actually some friends of ours that own a restaurant here, which is a fantastic restaurant, Coco. If you're in the area, if you're once you get back to going to restaurants, you should go to Coco because it's the best fried chicken in the world. Uh, but 
they put out a cookbook which is largely um, uh, Asian themed, but they have a mac and cheese recipe in it that is really uh, sublime. And so I've made that as a, you know, early in the pandemic, I was having making it every week and now it's been more like once a month, but I'll make that for Thanksgiving. Uh, and I'll make a pumpkin pie with real pumpkin. I don't do canned pumpkin. I get an yeah. actual pumpkin. Which is which, there's risk involved because you you might you might make it too watery. You have to you know, cook it down enough so it, that's not too watery. Uh, and I think I'll do the mashed potatoes. And I'm gonna I'm gonna do pigs in the blanket for for appetizer. Uh, and, Sounds and, good, man. You're making me hungry. And Gina Louise will do the turkey uh, and stuffing. Um, I'm not sure what else she has on tap. She might have some other things. My mom's do sweet potatoes. And I know, of course, there will be. This has to be a, a share family tradition. The uh, the showing of WKRP in Cincinnati. You no, know, I, I successfully, annual. I successfully had my first, um, you know, partial family showing of that last year. I mean, often I will watch it just with with Gene Louise. Um, but I actually got several family members to watch it with us last year. Not not the kids. I don't, <laughs> I don't think my kids can handle it. Um, but uh, as well, I they, just because of the, because the, they love animals so much. Correct. Correct. The idea, because there aren't any turkeys actually harmed in the filming of this. But. I mean, I literally drove past some wild turkeys the other day, and one of my kids got upset that what might happen to them. I said, the turkey turkey's going to be fine. And she just wrote an essay about why we shouldn't have turkey on Thanksgiving for school. So, wow. uh, you really I mean, radicalize them young, don't you, Bill? This is not my doing. You know? <laughs> not my doing at all. Um, <laughs> So I don't think that show go over well. But as I just recently shared on Twitter, if folks haven't seen this, there's a right way and a wrong way to watch the Turkeys Away episode yeah. of WKRP. And yes. the problem is um, WKRP always used real music in their shows, which was great to give an authentic feel of what a rock radio station is like, but is was a nightmare for copyright purposes, when it went into syndication and yeah. for DVD and for streaming. By the way, I, I don't know. I know you're right, but I don't know why it is that if you can clear something to to air, then why don't you own that in perpetuity? Like, why wouldn't that? What, you know, when you do copyright, it's just for specific uses, uh, and to pay for unlimited use is just much more expensive. Next thing, next thing you'll be telling me I can't call my podcast Matt Lewis in the news because of <laughs> copyright in French. Well, I actually I'm, I'm I'm making my own podcast right now, and I'm, and I'm downloading certain music for it that's royalty free. But technically speaking, it's supposed to be for a particular use. You know, it's not like you've you've downloaded the song, even though you've paid a fee for it. It's not it's not necessarily rights to use the song whenever you want. I mean, it wow. depends. It depends on what you're paying for. I had I had a, a viewer of ours, Chris Novembrino, my my current music, the the music I've been using on my podcast for the last year. Uh, he wrote and and recorded for me, so shout out there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, trust me, if it was up to me, I would be uh, my bumper music would be the power of love or something. <laughs> but you know, I feel like that might be pushing it a little too far. You know, that might. Maybe that would be crossing a line. I, I don't know. Other people, other people do it, but they don't have the platform that you and I have, Bill. So, so. basically, when the show ended syndication, they stripped out all the songs. Uh, and it's terrible. And and if you go, if you watch the version on, I know Prime Video, it's the version without any of the the real songs. It's all just generic instrumental rock music, uh, and. There's a company called Shout Factory that produced a DVD set, and they went through the rigmarole of getting the rights to most of the songs. Uh, and so I've read that they've got 85% of the songs. Uh, and so it's, so, it's, so it's pretty good to get your, the DVDs through yeah. them. But I know that even the version of Turkey's Away, there are three songs in Turkey's Away. Uh <laughs> One is Fun Time by this Joe Cocker. This is the episode that we're this, the, the, the the thanks episode. episode. We're talking about. Okay. One is Fun Time by Joe Cocker. One is um, it was a it was a Creedence Clearwater Revival. Um, I think it's I can't get it to fly. I think that that's the name of it. But the, those songs are just teeny tiny snippets. Yeah, and they, and they don't matter all that much. I mean, like I can't get it to fly. It's kind of a funny song to include, but you don't really hear the song very much. But there's a scene early in the show that involves Pink Floyd's dogs. 
and the song is intrinsic to the scene and yeah. the scene is intrinsic to setting up the plot that the big guy is not the big in, guy is the owner mr the, 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 sta the station manager is the son of the owner and oh, right right his mom his mom actually owns it right yeah. and, and he's kind of a dimwit and his mom knows he's a dimwit so he has a he has a do-nothing job as a figurehead and now the station flipped from classical to rock he's got even less to do and that scene is really critical of showing how out of sorts he feels being at the station now. And if you watch it on Prime Video, it just hacks the scene. It just like cuts a big chunk of it out. And you don't so, even know. So the scene is uh, they're playing this Pink Floyd song. There's like dogs barking in the background. It's, right. It's, 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 a, it's a weird Pink Floyd song. It's, it's not, it's it's not like a, it's not a snappy rock tune. No. And, and, and it's uh, not Wish You Were Here. And then Dr. Johnny Fever. Is he high? It's unclear. Is he it's, sleeping I mean, or is he stoned? It's, you know, it's, it, you don't know. <laughs> you don't know. Uh, and he's so this, this huge, huge culture clash. You've got correct. Johnny Fever, who is like a real legit disc jockey, like living the lifestyle. And Mr. Carlson, the conservative businessman, who's pretty friendly, but doesn't understand the scene. Right. And so at and least on the surface, like, Fever is like tripping out to Pink Floyd's dogs. Yeah, <laughs> and and Carlson, the big guy, is confused about what's going on with the station of his. And so to have that scene just just truncated, like the whole first half of the episode is just kind of a eh episode. You kind of don't even get what what why is this even that funny a show? Like it really is that important a scene. Now if you watch it on the Shout Factory DVD, they created some other song with dogs in it so it's not as bad but still not quite the same and there's actually a pink floyd reference that is taken out even in the shot factory version so the way to watch the show properly is when yeah. you get to that scene you can get the actual the original dog scene in a standalone clip on youtube so you got to stop your show watch the youtube clip See the real the real deal, and then go back to watching it on Prime Video or whatever else. Tweeted, you... You've tweeted this clip. That's correct. That, that is my public service it. announcement for the Thanksgiving holiday. Now, before we move on, we should have probably mentioned WKRP last week when we talked about intros, because it's a pretty good intro. Oh, yes. You know, baby, if, if you you've ever wanted. So that's good. Um, but the, the, the outro... The 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 closing mm -hmm. uh, music. What is, I like that, but what is it? Is it I, a, is I, it a real song? I think it's made for the show. I honestly I don't know off the top of my top of my head, but it is one. I think a rare time when you know a second song is made for a show, not just a re revamp. I mean, it of the sounds original. like it could have been like Bachman Turner Overdrive right. or some like classic rock band, but I just never heard. I've never heard it on the radio before. But it's it's good. I like it. Uh, it's by John El Jim Jim Ellis, and it uh, was made for the show. Made for made for the show. Isn't Jim Ellis like a, a Republican operative or something? Isn't there a? Isn't uh, it's probably not the same guy. Well, there. I mean, there there is the various Ellis's in the Bush family. <laughs> uh, and then, Bill, I've tried to get you to weigh in on this before, due to good taste and uh, wisdom. You you will not weigh in. On the uh, Bailey versus Jennifer, I will. I will not. Question. I will not do that. It's, I'll it's, tell you, in, in, inappropriate, Bailey. inappropriate and demeaning. Bailey, <laughs> it's Bailey, but okay, we don't have to go that. <laughs> um, apparently, no, Jim no. Jim Ellis didn't have lyrics for the closing theme, so he sang nonsense words to give an idea of how it would sound. And then the director of the show decided to use the words anyway, since it'd be funny to use lyrics that were deliberately gibberish. As satire and the, on the incomprehensibility of many rock songs. I kind of like that song, but okay. <laughs> anyway, we should get back. Uh, to get I, back. What is what I is also, that? Bill, I, I also, uh, I've played now twice Alice's Restaurant Massacre, mm -hmm. and it's uh, full, the you know, full extent, uh, such, 20 some minutes. Such a hippie. I played it. I played it for my kids. Uh, <laughs> luckily, they, they didn't pick up on some of the. Some of the nuances that I didn't really want them to pick up on, but they, they overall got it. That was good. You know, the restaurant is not too far from where I live. It's about an hour west. Really? Yeah. Is it Stockbridge, Massachusetts? Yeah, yeah, I think it's where it is. Okay. 
Because that's what he says. I don't know if you're familiar with the town of Stockbridge, yeah. Massachusetts. Right. But there's two stop signs, two police officers, something right. like that. Right. I mean, Stockbridge is, is in Berkshire County, uh, whereas I'm in Hampshire County. But it's you know it's not it's not too far. I use all these things as, as teachable opportunities, as Obama might say. Like my kids didn't understand that there was a draft until mm-hmm. I explained to them dodging the draft, you know, <laughs> <laughs> by being a litter bug. So. <laughs> Right, the actual restaurant is uh, Teresa's Stockbridge Cafe. Anyway, was it, I w- I know you you've probably exhausted your knowledge of it. I wonder if it was ever actually called Alice's Restaurant, or if Alice just worked at the restaurant. Yeah, I, th- I think there was a person named Alice who worked there, but it was the the. Uh, so I'm look, looking at Wikipedia. People come and listen to us so I can look up Wikipedia articles while we talk. They uh, should. <laughs> it's getting confusing because there was a TV show called Alice about a waitress. She worked at Mel's Diner. Uh, so And it's based on a movie. So at some mm-hmm. point, we really go down the rabbit hole with this. And, and it does it. And Linda Lavin, you've right. seen it. There was a movie, also, right? Also, yeah. also a great uh, TV show theme song. Uh, Alice I, doesn't live here anymore? Was that yeah, the movie? Yeah, that's the movie. We're not, I'm not going to let you talk about politics, Bill. We're, I'm just going to keep. I'm just going to keep bringing up pop culture stuff. Uh, Alice, <laughs> Alice Brock operated the restaurant called the Back Room in 1966 uh, on 40 Main Street in Stockbridge, directly underneath the studios of Norman Rockwell. The restaurant was closed by the time the song was released. Um, the last restaurant known to occupy the site was Teresa's Stockbridge Cafe, and the sign said formerly Alice's Restaurant. Stock uh, Stockbridge really punched it above its weight. <laughs> In the songs, it's a it's in uh, Rockabye Sweet Baby James. It gets mentioned as well, so uh, it's almost up there with Winslow, Arizona. You know, are you are people. you avoiding politics, Matt? Because you are saddened at the <laughs> yeah. wreckage that Donald Trump has levied to your party. That even at this late date, folks will barely acknowledge acknowledge that Biden won the election. Let alone congratulate him. Heaven forbid he gets congratulated that he won. Or any talk about working together for the good of the country. There's none of that going on in the Republican Party. Is 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 that dismaying you to such a degree that you rather I look up Wikipedia articles than talk about the state of the country? No, I am happy because it's Thanksgiving and because we now live at a time where you don't have to talk about politics all the time. Where we have the luxury. You're you're you're, you're redirecting breath. again. You're, you continue to avoid the question. We have to take a deep breath, and we don't have. I don't have to be focused on what crazy thing Donald Trump did or said. We can now focus on our 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 Thanksgiving dinners. We could focus on, um, you know, uh, Woody got Ar- Arlo Guthrie. Uh, and what's a Republican, by the way? Arlo Guthrie might still be. Well, that makes perfect sense, man. That makes perfect sense because we're both, uh, he and I are both fighting against the man (laughs) and fighting the system and keeping it real. And my guitar also kills fascists. So, (laughs) So, I mean, look, nothing I would like more than to never talk about Trump ever again. I I, I still have a a glimmer of hope that maybe this will be the case, or at least I will talk about him much, much less. But the fact that he is putting out signals that he wants to run again and might announce that he's running again very soon seems to make that impossible. How if if he it retains control of the party uh, and he and prevents anybody else from making a serious run at the nomination? How can you stop talking about him? Yeah, I, that's that's valid. Um, he'll he'll be relevant, but. Um, I think that probably, you know, the next six months, at least, are going to be about Joe Biden. And <clears throat> and so, yeah, I mean, Trump's going to be there. He's going to be lobbing grenades. He, and, and he very well may be. He could be. He could be the nominee four years from now. But four years is a long time. And uh, he could be. But I think the next six months are going to be pretty Biden centric, I would, I would assume. Well, so let's, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my due diligence as a, as a member of the all powerful media to not talk about Donald Trump for the moment, talk about Joe Biden. Now you and I talked during the campaign, you you were always worried that Joe Biden would usher in uh, the loony left 
He'd, he'd, he'd be pushed over and steamrolled by AOC and, and the squad. And I'd always say to you, Matt, you're misreading the party. It's more moderate than that. Uh, Biden's not going to be a softy. When you see the initial cabinet picks, how do you feel about the direction Joe Biden is going in? Very positive. Very positive. I, uh, you know, who knows? I mean, something will come out about somebody. But so far, it seems like uh, he's done about as good as you could possibly imagine. Did you see Tony Blinken's little talk today, Bill? You might have been doing an interview at that time. I, I did not see it. It was so inspiring. Uh, he talked about, I think it was his stepfather who uh, was, you know, hiding from the Nazis. And he saw this tank with, you know, it was an American tank. And he went over and used the only only words he knew in English were God bless America and how America needs to be a force for good again in the world. And it was like, I haven't heard any inspiring talk like that in four years. And Ronald Reagan could have, aside from the personal side of the story, I mean, but anecdotally, like Reagan, it was very similar to like rhetoric that Reagan did use during the, the Soviet, during the Cold War. So uh, I am uh, very happy so far. I, I will say this in defense of me. Um, <laughs> my concern was partly premised on the assumption that I felt Democrats were likely to pick up a lot more Senate seats. So I thought there was going to be more pressure on Biden um, from the Senate. And I also, I mean, we're, you know, we don't know how, I mean, I, I don't, I, I want to put, I want to put this, since we're talking about, you know, in some cases, diplomats, I want to be diplomatic, but I want to see how resilient Biden is in a year or two. That's part of part of my concern. But so far, so good. I'm happy. I'm pleased. Yeah, I mean, you know, Blinken's the kind of person who might have been picked anyway, regardless of the Senate composition. Uh, although I do think the fact that he was picked without a lot of um, drama over where to pick him or Susan Rice. Yeah. Uh, and I think Susan Rice, I think Susan Rice would have been a mistake. And I think it would have unleashed some of the old, you know, culture war stuff and Benghazi. And we don't need that. And I think I, Biden, was, I mean, Biden's signaling that he's he's not trying to pick fights with Republicans. Yeah. He doesn't want to have some big showdown to kind of show <laughs> who's boss. He's trying to. You know, what's funny, Bill, is I remember like when Mitt Romney and now, let me just caveat this. Mitt Romney has been one of the only respectable, decent Republicans in the past <laughs> year or two. But I remember when Romney was running for president in 2012, and I kept waking up being like, I, I got to quit giving this guy shit all the time. <laughs> uh, I want I want to, like, say something nice about Romney. And he would just rub me the wrong way constantly. Mm -hmm. um, and then... You know, Trump, obviously the same thing, like Trump literally he'll do something good and he he can't go 24 hours without messing it up. You know, so there was never Trump could never string together a couple days without offending me like viscerally. And, and uh, Joe Biden is <laughs> Joe Biden is actually I mean, he is handled. Like, I don't want to sound it would probably be in my own best interest, actually, to be the loyal opposition to Biden. So I, I'm, I'm not here trying to be a homer for mm -hmm. Joe Biden, but he has just handled this difficult last several weeks pretty much perfectly, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so so I, I think this does show that he doesn't doesn't want to have needless fights. Um he doesn't have needless fights with the left if he can avoid it. You know, Janet Yellen was someone designed, you know, I think one writer, I think it's Slate, said this wasn't a pick to make progressives happy, but to make them not sad. Uh, <laughs> whereas Lael Brader might have made them sad. Um, so he's not engendering, you know, massive blowback. But look, there are people on the left that don't like Blinken for, for the reasons why you like Blinken. They, they, they think he's too interventionist. Uh the, he was. I've, I've read that he was in favor of the Gulf War, um, the the Iraq War. Though I, I haven't gone back and read what exactly he did you know, during that time. Uh, I, I heard 
the very good. Have you ever listened to the commentary podcast? No. With uh, John Podhoretz? Mm -mm. It's really good. Um, and uh, Podhoretz, J Pod, as we call him, said something about Blinken's dad was like one of the founders of commentary or involved in the founding, mm -hmm. you know, with with uh, J Pod's dad and back in the day. So there's some. I understand why the left does. I understand why the left might not like him. That right. Much. So they're so they're not you know they're not over the moon by any stretch, but you're not seeing uh, highly vocal broadsides. In, in fact, you know, I, and I tweeted this out. Um, two top Bernie people, Matt Duss, who's Bernie's top foreign policy guy, and Faiz Shakir, who was his campaign manager, they had tweets praising Blinken and Duss saying, you know, Blinken is someone who has had. A regular outreach to the progressive grassroots. So they, they actually see him as someone who is on the team. Whereas uh, Rashida Tlaib tweeted out a couple of times in response to those two tweets, um, he better not suppress my free speech, uh, which would seemingly be a concern regarding um, the BDS movement, the, the Boycott Israel movement, because Pompeo has tried to... Um, uh, deny funding to groups that support BDS. Uh, and there was the episode when the, the Israeli government wouldn't let her come to Israel unless she promised not to talk about the boycott while she was on yeah. the, the soil what of the West Bank. What does that have to do with Blinken, though? Because well, Blinken it was tried the Israeli to... government... It was the government, the Israeli government, who wouldn't let her go there. I mean, there's... There's no way we could stop her if we wanted to stop her from talking about it. We couldn't, right? We can't stop her free speech. We, we can't. Now, so in that sense, the, the, the literal language of her tweet made no sense. Like, she, no one can stop her from promoting the boycott of Israel. Now, she may be, uh, and she might be constrained by the government of Israel on the soil of Israel, but that's not the State Department. Uh, the State Department could try to suppress the speech of other groups by, you know, through funding coercion, not by law. I can't throw them in jail because they could try to coerce them with their fines. And maybe that could be taken to court and try to be stopped in that way. But Biden and Blinken have said that they don't support that. They have said they're against the boycott, um, but they they respect people's free speech to voice their, their support of the boycott. So, it was a it was an off kilter thing for Tlaib to say because she could have said, "Her, uh, thank you, uh, what a great pick." Since he has said, and as Biden has said, he supports our free speech, um, but she chose to take a more confrontational tones. But I think she is an outlier here because even though there are those sorts of grumblings, they haven't really coalesced into something that reaches a critical yeah. mass that throws Biden off of his game. And this shows you, and you know, I'm. I'm always uh, cautious, cautiously expecting the left to, uh, you know, to rear its ugly head. But um, they really have been, minim you know, sort of sidelined <laughs> lately. Well, I, right? I, I, mean, I don't think I mean, maybe they're starting to, to, to grasp it. But, you know, they now have a very weak hand. Like the AOC's the squad, Justice Dem, Sunrise Movement, you know. They don't have strong cards to play right now. I mean, they're, they're sort of trying to play. You know, if you saw uh, when Biden picked Cedric Richmond to be one of his White House, top White House advisors, you know, Sunrise came out with a statement saying this smacks of betrayal. He's one of the biggest recipients of oil and gas money. He's from Louisiana Gulf Coast. So where a lot of oil companies are. Um, and, you know. Biden just didn't respond to that. He just picked him and moved on with his business. Uh, he's They're not breaking his stride very much. And well, I think it's one of Biden's, um, it's worked very well of Biden to not lower himself to, you know, stop to kick every barking dog, the expression, uh, which is the same thing he did with Trump. He doesn't. Like when, when, you know, the the GSA wasn't going to turn over transition funds or not yet, Biden could have made a big deal and complained and whined. And he was just like, oh, we'll be fine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, it'll, it'll work out. Now, another, um, another pick of note uh, is John Kerry. 
as this climate envoy, which you know, you Matt, might look at that as, well, that's a pretty standard liberal pick for Biden to make. But uh, there's a woman named Emily Atkin who does a climate uh, Substack newsletter called Heated. Uh, and she interviewed Kerry pretty recently. Uh, and she said, this is a signal that Biden wants to have a moderate approach on climate because Kerry started an organization that was designed to be bipartisan, distinct from what Al Gore has done with his organization. Um, and she interviewed Kerry about that. And Biden talked about that that openly, that that he was purposefully trying to do something that was going to bring in business and bring in Republicans and and create consensus around these things. And now Emily Atkin has some of the things that Kerry is wrong on that score strategically. Um, but I think it's notable that she said, you know, look at this pick through a moderate lens. This signals the kind of direction Biden wants to go in. So I'm actually quite curious who Biden's going to pick for energy and EPA. Uh, and I've not heard this speculate anywhere. I don't have any inside information on this subject. But I personally would not be shocked if one of those seats goes to a Republican. Uh, I mean, uh, you, would, you would think Biden's going to put a Republican somewhere. I mean, most administrations have some cross-pollination, though Trump's did not. You know, some will say Mnuchin was a Democrat, but he was, I don't think it's a registered Democrat now. Um, it's typical for Democrats to have a Republican at defense, which doesn't seem to be what they're going to do this time around. Uh, Obama had a Republican at transportation, uh, so and, and Bush had a Democrat at transportation. That's sort of like a safe place to put an opposite party person. It would be a little dicier, to put a Republican in an energy EPA because the, the climate left is so um, is so energized uh, and so demanding of, of, of robust action. Uh, but if Biden wants to say, hey, I want to depolarize this subject, I think there's a middle path here to get where we need to go. Doing a, you know, a Democratic EPA and a Republican energy might be a way to uh, send that signal. Bill, did you see some outlet? It might have been Vox. Um, had a piece out, maybe it was Axios, I forget. Some outlet had a piece up about the careerists, you know, how like, the careerists mm -hmm. are striking back. Mm -hmm. I just felt like after all we've been through, there's mm -hmm. going to be plenty of time to attack Biden, and I'm sure they'll do some bad stuff. Mm -hmm. But all we've been through, and now Joe Biden starts picking serious, competent, qualified people to serve as an administration. And the first thing we do is start bashing that <laughs> and calling it careerism. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't read the piece, but just the head. Well, I mean, I'm guilty of what I'm guilty of all the people who attack the headlines that I didn't write. <laughs> that I, that I didn't write. Well, it might have been a positive piece about careerism. Um, but th think about this, Matt. You know, Biden is the first Democrat to be elected president um, within four years of the last Democratic president. Right. So Obama was eight years. Clinton was 12 years. Carter was eight years. And then, you know, you know LBJ, you know, Kennedy was eight years uh, after Truman. You know, Johnson's the only one who didn't have that, that period because Kennedy was murdered. Um, so... Biden has the ability to, to take people who were in the White House just four years ago who are pretty experienced people, number one. Number two, you go back at every Democrat that was elected president all the way back to the Civil War. Every single one of them in some way is running as an outsider, as a page turner. Um, I mean, uh, you know, Grover Cleveland was, you know, Barely governor of Buffalo, <laughs> barely mayor of Buffalo for you. That was the first Democrat post Civil War. Woodrow Wilson was governor of New Jersey for a hot second <laughs> before he became, became president. Uh, FDR, was, I mean, he he had the better pedigree, but he wasn't in Washington. He was offering a whole different way to run the government than Hoover was was doing. Uh, Kennedy was you know Camelot, you know generational page turner. After after Eisenhower, Carter was I will not lie to you. Uh, Jimmy who uh, uh, Bill Clinton, a generational page turner, a guy from Arkansas, nowhere near Washington, D.C. 
and then of course Barack Obama. You know, Joe Biden is the first bona fide Washington insider to be a Democrat elected president in over a hundred years. So guess what? <laughs> He's not going to populate the government with a bunch of randos. He's going to think people who are experienced people like him, because that's what he ran on doing. And I think that's a feature, not a bug. And you would think that the mainstream media, after what we have been through for the last four years, would at least have a honeymoon. And yet this narrative about the swamp is emerging. And I think it's bullshit. Well, I, 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 I think Biden's getting, you know, a, a certain kind of honeymoon. Now he's not getting a Republican honeymoon. He's he's not getting Republicans walking with open arms. Let's find a way to work. We're, I mean, there were Democrats when Trump got elected, Warren, Bernie, Schumer, who are saying we're ready to work with you on infrastructure. You know, well, let's find something to work on together. Uh, you know, and there's nothing like that happening right now. Maybe that will shift. Maybe, maybe something will happen. Maybe someone's brain will snap too once the electoral college comes together. Or maybe when the, when the, after the, the electoral vote happens in the, in the Congress. Now, mind you, when we get to January 6th, uh, which is, I, I, think the, I think the runoff is the 5th, and the electoral college count is the 6th, if I remember correctly. Um, and that's when you know, the electoral college meets. Isn't it, isn't it? I thought it was like the 12th. No, isn't I, something December 12th? No, December 12th, the electoral college electors come together uh, and they vote. But then those votes get sent to Congress and Congress counts those votes on January 6th. That's in the Electoral Count Act. On January 6th. January okay, 6th. Sorry. So the new, the new Congress is sworn in and that's one of their first orders of business. Now... This is when Al Gore... That's, that's right. <laughs> when Al that's Gore right. did it. Right. So if you remember... When Al Gore was presiding as still vice president over that count, a bunch of House Democrats tried to challenge the vote. And they legally could not because you need to have one House member and one senator on your formal objection. Otherwise, it cannot be read into the record. So you have these one House Democrat after another coming up to the, to the well, and Gore would say, do you have a senator? And they would say, I don't have a senator. And Gore would say, you know, I'm sorry, you can't file this objection. And, you know, Maxine Waters says, I don't care, I don't have a senator. And Gore shot back, well, the rules do care. And, and Michael Moore took that scene and put it in Fahrenheit 9-11 as a way to mock Gore for not fighting, for being disrespectful to the House Democrats, many African-American, who were complaining that their vote was disenfranchised. Uh, yeah. I, and, I wonder how Michael Moore feels about about that now. I'm sure he's, I'm sure he'd say the same thing that Democrats don't fight hard enough. And so in 2000, <laughs> well, but yeah, but what if so in 2000, you know where I'm going with in that. 2004, there was some question about the vote in Ohio on the part of Democrats and Barbara Boxer did join a complaint. So there was a formal objection filed and under the rules, they had to stop the count. They had, they broke apart for two hours to debate and then they come back to vote and they voted to say this, this vote is fine. They proceeded. So it was a very, it was a minor hiccup and it wasn't well remembered. So I am pretty sure that there's going to be one House Republican and one Republican senator who are going to say that Pennsylvania's a fraud and Michigan's a fraud and Wisconsin's a fraud. And so it might just be that's two hours and we're done. It, or it, it, you can interpret the law differently. It could be they tried to different objections for different states. And so you might have multiple two hour periods where they do this. It's not going to stop by from being inaugurated because you, you um, depending on, depending on the situation, typically it could be that if the house votes to count it, that's sufficient. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, if you need both chambers, depending on the type of objection, um, presumably Romney Collins, Murkowski would come over and it would be fine. It's just so weird. I, I, you know, there's a quote attributed to Stalin where he says, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who who votes. It matters who counts the votes. Mm-hmm. Actually, it matters who certifies the votes. <laughs> like, like, who knew that you could basically, you know, that these, you know, Republican 
state legislatures could just send a different slate of delegates or whatever. I think we need to spell this out a little more uh, statutorily going forward. I mean, I, I wrote a piece, a lot of people wrote these pieces, but I wrote a piece at the Daily Beast a few months ago, how to Trump proof the next presidency. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, several reforms that we should have. One of one of them would just be simply, you should be required to show your tax to release your taxes before you run for president, right? Um, and I think we maybe need to tighten up some of these rules about actually how <laughs> how these things are uh, are certified. That may be. I, mean, I, I haven't gone through and looked over every state legislator's election code to know if there really was a weak spot there. I, I mean, I think in vast majority of these cases, if not all of them, uh, even if a couple of Republican certifiers went rogue, it would get brought to court and the judges would rule you know, honorable. Well, you're, you're assuming the judges are are. We've been blessed by these judges that we still have judges that are apolitical or put the rule of law above politics. But like, you could imagine a scenario like, what if our judges? Some of these are elected judges. I mean, some are appointed. But I mean, you could imagine a scenario where it gets to the point where our judges are Republican. I'm going to pick on Republicans because they deserve it right now. It, it could be the other side someday. Um, you could imagine a scenario where like, the Republican judges are just as compromised as the other Republicans. Well, look, I mean, democracy is, in the end, reliant on the humans that participate in it. You know, if you want to if you want like to uh, assume a scenario where like a whole slew of people up and down these various echelons of government all conspire to thwart the popular will. You know, in theory, you could paint that scenario, but I, I take the glass half full. Look at this. We 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 create a system with lots of checks and balances, with lots of different uh, with diffusion of power uh, and a judiciary with lifetime appointments to insulate them from politics and is working exactly as the founders intended. You know, even though you had an incumbent president of the United States waging war on this system. The system held up. You know, there aren't any people that failed to certify the vote properly. We had two people in Michigan that threatened to go rogue and caved <laughs> properly and then, then tried to do backsies afterwards. That's, that's the worst example. And there was one guy in Michigan who got outvoted. You know, beyond yeah. that, Republican secretaries of state, vote certifiers, judges, they've all done the right thing. In part because of the way that the system is constructed, it is well, designed I, I, to be I will, this way. I will concede that our founders uh, were brilliant and pitting ambition against ambition and having checks and balances and the divisions of power and, and all that. Um, however, just because it worked this time doesn't, you know, you're, you're assuming that this is proof that the system is resilient and strong. It could be that Trump has weakened it or it's shown the next authoritarian uh, how, to, how it's done. And if Trump had gotten eight years instead of four, it's hard to say what he might have been able to do in those next four years to, uh, you know, erode this, uh, these institutions. So uh, I mean, I mean, look, yeah, I, 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 something that we might want to look into. I mean, I think like I think Bush v. Gore was a travesty. Uh, I think that was, I think that was a stolen election. I think if there was a full and proper recount of Florida, I mean, as, as the AP did, if they if they did the recount, not the one that Gore asked for, which was a partial recount, if they did the full recount and they counted the undervotes and the overvotes, Gore actually came out ahead in the, in the AP's telling of it. And it was a it was a full statewide recount that the Florida judge tried to do that the Supreme Court stopped. So that's why I think that was an actual bona fide travesty. Uh, and as horrible as that was, it has not fundamentally eroded the Democratic system. I mean, a lot of Democrats assumed that Bush v. Gore was evidence that Republicans will do whatever it takes regardless of circumstance. And this election shows that that's not the case. Even though you have a, a Republican president trying to do that, plenty of Republican judges, plenty of Republican secretaries of state, plenty of Republican certifiers did not take it to that level. Well, and, you know, kudos to uh, some of those somewhat, you know, not unsung, but uh, underrated heroes like the Georgia Secretary of State, for example, or um, 
uh, some of the guys in Michigan. Um, you know, democracy doesn't work without these people. I mean, if if the Georgia Secretary of State acted like the two U.S. senators in Georgia, we would have a problem. Now, I think this raises you know, but, a point. But can we count on what if what if the Georgia Secretary of State had acted like Leffler? Well, I mean, part, part, part of the issue here is this is a democracy. Now, Bush v. Gore was weird because it was kind of a tie. <laughs> you know, it was really, 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 really close. Uh, and so uh, I think that made things a little bit easier for funny business to reign because it was a bona fide murky outcome. This is not a murky outcome. There are no states that are that close. The overall popular vote is not at all close. And so to take that kind of action would be a manifest attempt to assert popular will. And when it mm -hmm. comes down to it, the vast array of people in a position to do something about it, we're not going to do something to go in violation of their own state's popular will because there's cost to doing that. Uh, so that, that, I think that helps explain what, what happens at the city, county, state level. And in the judiciary, again, they are insulated from politics because of the lifetime appointments. Uh, and that allows them to do the honorable thing most of the time. Uh, now, there's imperfections, this, of course. You can point out other examples where not so great things happen. I'm not saying by its very nature, democracy is not perfect. But this system is working as well as it is because of its, of, of its design. Well, uh, you've cheered me up again. <laughs> I'm optimistic. I'm happy. It's, uh... you're, you're, you're a Joe Biden Democrat. Well, I don't think I'm quite there yet, Bill. But um, you're giving you're 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 saying you're ascending to a Joe Biden honeymoon. Well, the Republicans are just so bad right now, too. <laughs> I mean, it's. <laughs> I mean, did you follow? The, we got to go soon, but I mean, did you follow this Sidney Powell thing, Bill? Yeah, yeah. Did you watch this? I saw some. It's clips. insanity. Mm -hmm. These people. These people are insane. Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I don't know how you can be <laughs> in a party or a movement with those people. You know, some people have other. I mean, you know, there, there's polls that have come out about 2024 where Trump leads. Uh, I, I saw one where we had 53 percent. I, I, I don't believe polls. So I mean, it, I, 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 maybe I'm a bad person for jumping back <laughs> into the poll pool so quickly. And again, I wouldn't take any of these polls with. <laughs> To, with, with, I wouldn't treat them with granular precision. I just want to say every time the next four years you cite a poll, I, I'm just going to stop you for a second and say, I'm playing this game in protest. Fair uh, enough, fair will, enough. I'm going to appeal this to the commissioner, Bob Wright. <laughs> I, I've seen two 2024 polls. One had Trump winning 53% of the Republican vote in a primary, and one I think it was 35, but still leading. Who are the evil people doing these polls right now? What kind of person? What kind of person wakes up three days ago, a week ago, and says, "You know what the world needs right now? You know what's going to make this world a better place? A poll." Well, you that know, shows you Donald know, Trump. Look, if if you're a Republican and you're trying to figure out where do we go from here, I mean, and I, I got the lion's share Republicans are thinking about how do I get this Trump monkey off my back? Is it possible? Can I can I find a way to sh shunt them to the side without, you know, incinerating my own career? You, you're going to have to find some polling data. You, right, you, those are you can do internal polls. You don't need to, like, make a news story out of it. Well, that's everything's cool. about the bill. You and your mainstream media. buddies. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, I, what, I, what I want to ask you here, Matt, is if I take these polls at rough face value, not that, not that the exact number is perfectly on point. I mean, these are just Republicans. There's no hidden Trump vote here. This is just Republicans, presumably. Uh, doesn't it suggest that I should not look at all 73 million Trump voters and assume they are all diehard, ride or die Trump Sidney Powell is telling the truth. This whole thing's rigged. Um, that perhaps it's roughly half of the party that is dire Trump getting out or the exact number. But there is a fairly large portion of it. You know, maybe it's a minority portion. Maybe it's actually more than half. I don't know. 
some portion that says, I voted for Trump because he's a Republican, and I'm a Republican, that's it. Yeah. I, I have no deep loyalty to this guy. I'm happy to vote for Pence or Rubio or even Mitt Romney. I don't care. Whoever you throw up there, I'm going to vote for that guy. Um, if that's the case, shouldn't more Republicans, you know, stretch out their arms and legs and see if they can make a name for themselves with the group of Republicans who are not diehard Trumpers? Well, I... I think so, mainly because the idea that you're going to outweigh Trump or you're going to finesse this and he's going to go away is silly. And it's what they tried. It's what Ted Cruz tried to do in 2016, and it just doesn't work. So, like, you know, appeasing him is like feeding a crocodile, hoping it eats you last, as Churchill said. I mean, that's what they're doing. That's been the strategy all along. And, you know... Uh, I just don't see that happening. Um, but they're in, a, they're in a bind because he is still very popular and um, and they're afraid of him. I mean, they're afraid of his voters, which is essentially the same thing. Right. Uh, one last thought before we, before we run. I know you have to jump. Um, what did you make of Trump coming out just to say we hit 30,000 in the Dow? My, my initial thought was, they're going to put together some kind of video. There's going to be some kind of, so maybe it's a documentary uh, where like, we're going to end on that. This is going to be the capstone of the Trump presidency and try to drive home. I got us to 30,000 at the Dow. This was the most successful presidency of all time. I mean, why, why else do that? Why come up for one minute just to say that? If not, you, you, I mean, it's like when he came home from Walter Reed and he, yeah. and he took off the mask and saluted the choppers. That was immediately turned into a campaign video. Wouldn't this, in theory, be the same kind of setup? You've got a very devious mind, Bill. And I like <laughs> I like the way you think. I think you're, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think you're probably right. I mean, look, Donald Trump is uh, trying to craft a narrative that he won the election, or at least there's a plausible case to be made that he won. So he's not a loser. Um, and... A lot of this is about staying relevant and um, and crafting an alternative history and a narrative. And I think that uh, it's always nice to have good video footage for that narrative. All right. Always good to talk to you, Matt. Have a great Thanksgiving, a safe Thanksgiving. You too, man. Wear, wear a mask. Uh, eat, eat that mac and cheese. <laughs> Watch WKRP in Cincinnati. One last thing. Booger! <laughs> That's in the first episode, not the Thanksgiving episode. <laughs> oh, also, whatever you do, don't take your garbage down uh, and dump it in front of the mayor's house. And uh, also, don't dump it off any cliffs if the if the uh, <laughs> if the dump is closed, the landfill if it's closed on Thanksgiving Day. They do that sometimes. <laughs> Don't do that either. Such a hippie, Matt. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you next week. See you guys. Bye.